Mike, it's a great honor to have you here in Zurich. Uh, uh, can I just say, it's not only a great honor to be here, but that applause is fantastic, and I feel that we've really finished now. We can go. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. Exactly. <laughs> Topsy-turvy. <laughs> yes, right. um, if we can go back to the beginning, as it were, when you were growing up, uh, it was a great, great period of ferment in British theatre and film. I mean, you had everybody from John Osborne, Tony Richardson, Sheila Delaney. In, in, in theatre, you had, uh, you had uh, Carol Rice, John Schlesinger, Lindsay Anderson in film. There was a sense of something that was rebelling against the rather, rather uh, uh, fastidious cinema of the, 50, of the 50s, 40s and 50s. Uh, were you influenced by that as a, as a youngster? Did you... Feel um, that atmosphere. Y yes, yes, and no is sort of the answer to that. I mean, of course, I'm um, a little bit younger than you are, but not much, and uh, <laughs> not just a bit. But we we both remember that um, in the 40s and 50s, particularly, um, our diet of cinema was entirely Hollywood and British movies, old-fashioned British movies. Um, so, uh, 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 before we get on to the question of the, those new wave filmmakers, yeah, yeah, so-called, yeah. that you're talking about, you know, I mean, somehow, although I never had the privilege of seeing a film that, was, that wasn't in English until I was 17 in 1960 and went to London, because in Manchester all I ever saw was the British and uh, 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 Hollywood films, um, of course, what we were looking at were some terrible films, mm. but also some great cinema. I mean, we saw, I mean, all those Hollywood and some very good British films, not least the, the great British comedies, the, the Ealing films and so on, were, were, were very good news. And so in, in a way, um, although uh, one reacted against all of that, at the same time, uh, those well-made films are all also somewhere in our cinema, cinematic DNA. Yeah. Uh, uh, but um, I always used to, as a child, sit in the cinema thinking, um, wouldn't it be great if you could have a film where the characters were like real people? Of course, what I didn't know is that that was happening elsewhere. It was happening in Italy, it happened, you know, but I didn't know that. And then all of a sudden, in the late 50s, mm -hmm. there was this one film about which we may now have different ideas or different views or different tastes, which was Room at the Top yeah. by Jack Clayton. Now, when I saw that, what was extraordinary about it was that a, a, a substantial... Um, part of what it was about and what you saw and the landscape, the, the working class northern English landscape that we were looking at was what I was going to find when I walked out of the cinema into the street. And that was very exciting. In the grander scheme of things, when you look back at that particular film, although Jack Clayton was a great filmmaker and The Innocents, mm. uh, his adaptation of the Henry James Turner, of the screw, it's fantastic. It, it, it's not as real or as great a film as that. The real breakthrough, I think, was the film, was Carol Rice's Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, which really got down to the gritty. And then this sporting life to a yes, couple of life absolutely. years later. Yeah. But to answer your question, I mean, by the time those films were happening, I was sort of, you know, uh, reached the stage of formulating, being a, you know, I was just heading towards being born and being a possible filmmaker. I was looking at those films at the same time as discovering the Nouvelle Vague. Mm. And, and indeed, one or two other things were going on, like John Cassavetti's first film, Shadows, and so forth. Now, I feel, I sort of think, I don't know what you think, but those, all those British so-called new wave films, good as some of them were, and they varied, they were all adaptations 
mm. of plays or novels. Yeah. And they all had a certain kind theatricality. of theatricality, of staginess yes. about them. Yes. I think, th I would actually not use the word theatricality because I think that the element of theatricality is not a bad thing in a film. And I, indeed, you could say in some respects there's a kind of element of the the combustion of theatricality in my own films, mm. but staginess mm. is, a, is something else. And I think that uh, um, in that respect, I instinctively felt one wanted something else, mm. Mm. which was slight to some extent, um, was influenced more by the French, what the French. Mm. 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 I, I think, just before you want to obviously move on from this, but I actually think personally that the the only film that came out of that stable, the first film, I should say, that came out of that stable that really was pure in the sense that I'm implicitly talking about was If of Lindsay Anderson, which yeah. didn't happen for some years. That was late in the later 60s. And, you know, it wasn't a film about the, the, the raw working class life. It, it was, was a fantasy in many ways. It was a ways. fantasy, but also it came out of Lindsay Anderson's own feeling about his own life yeah. experience. But... Um, uh, it wasn't the revolution that wanted to happen. Mm. wasn't really didn't really happen. Certainly in in um, the UK uh, until Ken Loach mm -hmm. and his producer Tony Garnett came along mm. at first in television. Sixty seven. Yeah, and that they really um, said, okay, let's get out there and make films that really are about the real world. Yeah, gritty. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, your first film, the first feature film, the one that I was aware of, was, was uh, Bleak Moments, uh, which I know you had uh, some difficulty both in setting up and then, of course, recovering from. <laughs> and, and if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm going to read you a, a little extract from my original review, written in 1972, uh, where I said that... Microphone. I said... The film emphasizes the difficulty of accepting life's puzzles as impediments to be calmly met. It is a wholly fascinating... Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong guy. Uh, uh, somebody else would review or something else. That was a good, that was a good film, no, that's too. Right. Here that's, we are. Right. <laughs> that's right. Bleak Moments is infinitely more original than A Clockwork Orange or The Devils, and its intensity marks Mike Lee as the most promising new director of the year. Well, I was very proud of the fact that that came true. <laughs> I, I was saying to, to Peter before that, of course, um, I, I'm very aware of this eulogy, and we printed it, and we used it on... We, my producer and I tried to raise money for another film, which never materialised, and we used Peter's quote in very, very large reproduction of it mm -hmm. on our film. But it got us nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very flattering because, of course, that was the year of the Clockwork yeah. Orange, yeah, right. and of course, the Clockwork Orange is a great film. So, so much more flashy. Yeah, of course. But we were very flattered. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's also, what I liked uh, about Bleak Moments was the fact that it was in some way depressing, but in another way it wasn't, because there were some very funny moments in it, very human moments. There's a restaurant scene involving Sylvia and Peter, both equally inhibited people, um, and yet it's incredibly funny. And I think humour seems to be indispensable to you as a director. Well, well I, I don't look at it like that. I mean, life is hilarious and tragic mm -hmm. and that is the way it is mm -hmm. that's the way it comes out of the seam and so I, I, people say to me when do you decide when to be funny and when to be i don't i mean you know like it's all it's complex and I, I, and indeed there are films i've made and sex uh, aspects or sequences or scenes moments where somebody, some people have said that was terribly, terribly sad, and other people have said, made me laugh. Yeah, that's <laughs> so right. li life is. That well, well, everybody has a different sense of humour. Well, I they? think that's right, and some people have no sense of humour at all, <laughs> <laughs> and most of them are film critics. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My. <laughs> Thank you. Present company accepted. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, like some of the great uh, European directors of the period when, when you were growing up, like, say, Ingmar Bergman or um, Carlos Saura in Spain, you would work with the same troupe of people over and over again. You tend to work with the Dick Pope, who, who we talked to this morning. Uh, you tend to work with the same troupe of actors playing very different roles, but nevertheless all working with you and obviously getting to know you and getting over the years. Um, how difficult was that when you, were, when you were working both in television, theatre and film? Well, the only difficulty in the early... Uh, I mean, what everybody knows, and I don't especially want to talk about it in any uh, detail or indeed at all, is the fact that I don't have a conventional... I don't have a script in the conventional sense. I mean, we arrive at something which is very precise mm. and scripted through the work. Um, the only difficulty in the early days was persuading... You'd say to actors, there's no script, and I can't really tell you what it's about. Come and have it. And, and they would... They would it would, you had to go out and find people who would do it, mm -hmm. whereas now, of course, and lots of people want to do it, and there are far more actors who want to do it than I will ever get around to working with. I, I do like to work with the same, the same people, but, but not. It, it isn't a kind of... It's by n no means a closed shop. I mean, there are always new people, uh, younger actors even. I mean, you know... Um, uh, uh, there are actors I've had... Uh, Imelda Staunton, who pl mm. plays Vera Drake. I did a small part in another year. Um, I'd never worked with before, but she stuck to water and she... You know. So I, I, I look... I like to work with an ever-shifting population of people, but there are... If somebody's good, and mm. these guys are very good, and they are character actors, let's yeah. say, as you say, they are versatile and are good at playing real people out there in the street mm. and all kinds of people then, uh, you know, one comes back to them, really. Leslie's, Leslie Manville will work on the seventh L film. She's actually the record holder. Right. I think it's now up to ten, actually. Films, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, for a long period, after bleak moments, after that, in that bleak period, as it were, you uh, managed to really make a name as a television director and also as a stage director. Um, what's the essential difference between making a film for television and making a f feature film? Is there any? Well, in the ultimate analysis, no, there isn't. Uh, we, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, as you know, in that pe the, the, re the period in which I didn't make uh, a feature film, nobody did. Mm. I mean, it was very difficult, if not impossible, to make a uh, serious indigenous British feature film you know very well um, I, had anybody said to us to me that in 1971 when we made bleak moments that the next feature film wouldn't be for another 18 years i probably would have jumped off waterloo bridge yeah. outside the national film theater <laughs> um, <laughs> but um I, 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 because you didn't one couldn't know that the truth was that out here in the big wide world um, everybody thought there was no British mm. cinema. And there was. It was very rich, very diverse, very um, engaging and very important. Mm. Uh, but it was hiding in television. Mm. Ken Loach, Stephen Fry, a whole bunch of people. Mm. We all made our films mostly at the BBC, but not entirely. Mm. Um, and it really wasn't possible to make feature films until... Uh, Channel 4 started. I was going to say, Film 4 has supported you uh, uh, through the years. But, yeah. but, but the question, your question about the difference between making... Of, I mean, in the end, uh, I, I took the view, and it is the case, a film is a film is a film. Mm. I mean, the differences were, first of all, um, you, you, one was work, working inside an institution. The BBC at that time was a very liberal outfit to work for. Mm. And you, I, I would literally go in and the, once it was agreed that I would do a film, the, the, the producer would say, well, those are the dates, this is the budget, go and make a film. Mm. And there were no further questions. You'd mm. go out mm. and do mm. it. And, and mm -hmm. that was, 
as it should yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we did them on 16 millimeter and not 35, so yeah. that, you know, we knew they were going to be for a small screen and we knew that they'd be seen probably once, maybe twice, mm -hmm. when you would get four, five, six, eight, ten million viewers. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond those differences, it was a film and you'd be out there with a film crew on location and making a film. And so, uh, ultimately, I regard the films I've made be they the television ones or the cinema ones, as being 20 films that uh, follow bleak moments. Yeah, I mean, Nuts in May could as well be a feature film Absolutely. In, in the cinema. Uh, I would yes. thought so. yeah. um, Many of your films are inhabited by lost people, drifters, who need to find themselves and have great difficulty in communicating. I think this is one of the themes of your work, is that people sometimes have difficulty in communicating, and the, the, this very poignant ending of, of Secrets and Lies, where Timothy Wall says, you know, everybody's in pain, but why can't we share our pain? I think that's, that's very emblematic of your, your, your cinema. I think so. I mean, I, I, I find it very hard to um, isolate one, of the the one running theme from another, because they're all compound. Um, somebody this morning asked me, um, said, well, um, uh, um, happy, happiness, and I've forgotten the other thing, um, uh, talk about that in relation to your... And she was talking about the difference, she was relating happy-go-lucky mm -hmm. to another year. Uh, and I said, well, in the end, you, the way I look at life, the way we conceive and create these characters, the way we, ma I, we make these films and what these films are about. Look at people, whoever they are, both in, t both in terms of how they are and what their preoccupations are, but also in their social context, in their social, economic, cultural uh, context. And you can't separate those things. Mm -hmm. So you're right to say, well, uh, one of the themes is um, finding yourself feeling part of, feeling belonging, but that's also because I make films about families, about I mean, one of the things that I know inevitably, even though I don't do it consciously, is one of the running themes of my films, comes from my own uh, appalling childhood and background, which is that is that whole thing of masks and, you know, being, trying to be honest and be what you really are and not being what you think everybody else pre um, thinks you ought to be. But that's because I grew up in a world, as many of people of our age did, where our parents had gone, their lives had gone to hell and back during World War II. So the 50s were that terribly squeaky clean, obsessively um, uh, well-behaved decade, um, which is why we all let our hair down literally in the 1960s. Um, and so, and that theme runs all through, even as far as film like Topsy Turvy, which is about masks and, you know, the real people behind the, 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 the theatrical facade and yeah. so on and so forth. So I think all these things are interrelated and uh, linked. Yes, in Naked, for example, you've, you've, in Naked you have this sense of, of uh, all the time that David Thewlis's character, who's charging through life, as it were, almost in inchoate anger, he's trying to express himself and trying to find a place where he feels at home. And there's one wonderful scene, I'd, I'd love if you could tell this story, when, uh, because I think it illustrates your, your skill in improvisation, that uh, there was a scene when they, he meets you and Bremner on a Soho street corner, and you rehearsed this at night, uh, rather informally, and they start arguing, and then finally they get into a fight. And I think somebody called the police, didn't they? And you yes, I mean, it, 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 it's sort of uh, actually, it's proper for you to remember it as being at night in Soho. In fact, um, that the scene when we eventually shot it was at night in Soho, but the actual rehearsal. Um, was in the day in Marleybone on the steps of a church near where we were used as a, re a building we were using as a rehearsal base. And indeed, um, that uh, Ewan Bremner was, they, they weren't having a fight. It was just that Ewan Bremner, as he does in the film, was screaming, Maggie! And scramming. Through. And finally, somebody leaned out the window and said, Can you stop making that noise? And he told them to fuck off. <laughs> and they, they called the police. <laughs> and uh, a police car 
screech to a halt and out jump the cops. Now, what I do on all these occasions, I'm lurking about somewhere. The actors are in character. They've gone into character, and the name of the game is they stay in character. <laughs> but so I leap out, and as I did on these emergency occasions, say, um, the, the magic words are come out of character. So I said, come out of character. And these guys... Like a hypnotist, really. Well, yes. I suppose out of a trance, yes. Yeah. But they... And I intervened and said, look, um, this is actually not real. This is... And, of course, the police said, what? You know. And um, eventually... Where are the cameras? Well, that's right. And they do ask that question, where are the cameras? Because <laughs> they're making a film. There must be a camera there. But this was about... This is about six weeks before we, you know, and we had to, so we went back to the, we took them back to the rehearsal base where there was an assistant waiting for us and so on, and that was okay. But there's a much better version of that story, which I, I know there isn't time, but I'm obliged to tell it because it's, it, I love it more. Um, <laughs> in that, if you've seen High Hopes, mm. right at the beginning of High Hopes, this young lad um, arrives in, in London and he happens acro across what we soon discover is the central character of the film. Um, Cyril, played by Phil Davis, and he asks him the way, and he doesn't know the way. He asks him where an address is, because he's looking for his sister, and he doesn't know, so he takes him inside to get his London A to Z map book out, um, and so on. Now, again, months before we ever got to shoot this beginning, I didn't even know at this stage it would be the beginning of the film, uh, I, we set up, I set up an improvisation, with, and the actor, Jason Watkins playing this lad. I, I said to him, okay, go in that direction. And if you see somebody that you know is played by one of the other actors in the film, you'll recognize, then that's, ask that, you should ask that person the way. Um, Philip Davis was there to, with his motorbike, fixing it up. And I realized, since we were in an area just north of King's Cross, that Phil Davis would know very well. I thought, well, the only way to make sure he doesn't know where the, know the address is to invent an address that doesn't exist. So I invented an address that didn't exist, and, he, and of course, Phil Davis in character didn't for a moment think this is an address that doesn't exist. He said, oh, I don't recognize that. Um, and at that moment, an enormous police horse materialized from behind a wall with an enormous, with a huge sort of chief inspector kind of character on top of the horse. And he said, well, what's going on? And he said, can I help? And they said, yes, um, do you know where this is? <laughs> the, the inspector said, no, I don't actually, I don't recognize that. And he got on, he started to get on his phone and get and he said, walkie talking, to go back to the, to the HQ. And so I leapt out and said, come out of character. And I must say, although Phil, Davis and Jason Watkins did come out of character. Neither the, the inspector nor the horse came out of character. <laughs> um, and I had to explain that this wasn't real. Well, of course, it confounds even an experienced senior policeman to be told that he's in a world that's not real, that it doesn't exist. <laughs> Let us move on. Yes, OK. <laughs> well, what you said about the squeaky clean 50s, I like that phrase. Uh, and in a way, for me, the topography of your films illustrates exactly this because you love to work in terraced houses very often and you have this front room which we used to call the posh, you know, which was often not used that much but was kept very, very clean with its anti-macassars and so on. And then you have the inner workings of the house, you have the kitchen and the small bathroom and then you have the staircase. And I, all of these elements are very important to you in, in repeatedly in, in films, it seems to me. Yeah, they're just, the, it's the environment. It's the, I mean, I have, I think I sh should probably be in the Guinness Book of Records. I've had more staircase scenes than anybody else. Any, you know, I like staircases. Uh, Very um, difficult to light and set up for people like Dick Pope, I should think. Absolutely, but they're great to look at and, you know, things go, you know. But, no, I, what you're talking about is, you know, simply in one form or another, is the, I suppose I'm simply, as I did in from bleak moments onwards, looking at that world in which I grew up, mm -hmm. although it, uh, it has manifested itself in all sorts of different ways. And of course, there are times when we move away from that environment as well. I did, um, st when we were shooting the scene in Happy Go Lucky, 
um, a few years ago, uh, uh, and we were down at South End on Sea when she goes to visit her sister, who is very, very much in the mightly tradition of um, humorless um, suburban sisters. I have a humorless suburban sister myself. <laughs> um, uh, um, fortunately, she won't know whatever I said here this afternoon. You know. um, I, Dick and I, Dick Pope, when I was standing in the garden uh, of this, and I said to Dick, I am, this is the last suburban house I'm ever going, to, no, no, I said, this is the last suburban back garden I'm ever going to shoot in, you see. And Dick said, right, okay, fair enough. We'd been talking about making a film about Turner already by that time. So when we were then standing in the back garden of the next film, which was <laughs> another year, which is there's also back garden scenes, he stick said to me, um, I thought you said we weren't going to film in any more back gardens. But then we got to do Mr. Turner, and I think we managed to get away from our Absolutely. suburban back garden. <laughs> but in addition to Turner, who we'll come to in a minute, you've made uh, a film about two other great, in my opinion, great artists of Britain, and that is Gilbert and Sullivan in Topsy Turvy. Now, Gilbert and Sullivan, at least in my day, was, were rejected by the, in quotes, intellectuals, uh, rather as operetta as rejected, because it couldn't be serious. You know, it wasn't Tosca, it wasn't about great drama, earth-shattering affairs. It was frivolous, and it was merry. But I think that's what made it so good. And when you think of the tunes that Arthur Sullivan produced, they're prodigious, and you capture that in Topsy Turvy so well. Yes, actually, as you may know, I've just lately this year directed The Pirates of Penzance oh, for the English National Opera. Well, my son was major general in that, at his school plan. There yeah. you go. Well, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I he was the very model of a modern major That's general. right, exactly. Um, but, uh, um, and incidentally, this production... Uh, in, is going to be in Luxembourg in a few weeks' time, and then in German, in um, Saarbrücken. So I just thought I'd mention that in yeah. case you're interested. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but um, it's great music. It is terrific music. Mm -hmm. And it's great writing. Mm -hmm. um, and it is totally trivial. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody said to me, what's the difference between Mr. Turner and um, Topsy Turvy? And, well, apart from anything else, I mean, Mr. Turner is about, um, is a profound film about a profound artist. And Topsy Turvy is a profound film about trivial artists. Mm, yeah. But they were very, very good yes. at their, what they did that That's right. in this trivial way. And there's plenty of place mm -hmm. for entertaining things. As well. And there you get also the contrast which you referred to earlier between, the, as it were, the backstage of life, the real things of life, and the front stage, which is what we all want to be seen, which is when you're all ma made up beautifully in beautiful costumes, but backstage or in the alleyways of London, well, different things. Th are going that's on. what. That's why it seemed to me uh, a really good subject to tackle, because you know here is this you know chocolate box world of these Victorian mm. souffle, um, uh, uh, and you know, but actually these were working people. Mm -hmm who took what they did very, took very seriously, the thing that we, in show business and film, take very seriously, mm -hmm. which is the serious job of entertaining you. Mm -hmm. And that's what the film's about. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, to me, that's... Uh, and, of course, we approached the thing mm -hmm. in exactly the same way as all these other films, which is the real people doing something and living in a real world, having their own problems and pain and suffering yeah. and joy and all the rest of it, you know. Two of your greatest films have won the Palme d'Or in Cannes and, uh, and the Golden Lion in Berlin. Secrets and Lies. Venice. Venice. Venice, I'm sorry. F Secrets and Lies, the first of them, made in 1996, I think. Um, that is extremely poignant when one sees it again today, as I did in preparation for this, for this talk. It stands up very unbelievably well. And Timothy Spall's performance is heartrending, I think. It's amazing. It's, it's over the top, it's buffoonish, but it's incredibly poignant. Really is. I don't know whether I agree that it's buffoonish. No. To be honest, Nobody can, yeah. no. I mean, he can do that, yeah, but I yeah, don't think he does yeah. it in that film. No, he doesn't. Uh, well, life is sweet. Well, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, for, def for sure. Uh, and and then Vera Drake, of course, and both of them are set in that suburban, in that suburban world. In yes, a way. yes. Um, I mean, I, 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 yes. Although Vera Drake, of course, is a very much an urban 
yeah. uh, context uh, rather than suburban. Um, but I, um, both those films came out of specific uh, direct experiences. Mm. Um, there are people close to me in my life who had uh, um, adoption mm. related experiences and I thought that that was worth looking into and pursuing. Mm -hmm. uh, and Vera Drake, which is, you know, everyone knows this about um, a, an illegal backstreet abortionist at a time before the Abortion Act mm. in the 1960s. I'm old enough, as you are, to remember what it was like when people had unwanted pregnancies mm. and, you know, these women were around. Um, and for, a v I, unlike most of my films, which, you, you know, come out of different kind of source of ideas, that very specific notion to make a film about that, mm. I, I sat on for about 40 years, actually. Um, and then decided eventually that it should be done. Mm. Um, so that's where, where that came mm. from. Yeah. How do how do you get to the titles of your films, Mike? Because they all seem they seem extremely effective. The titles are very very good of your films, but I have a feeling that they're arrived at after a lot of work, preliminary work, and suddenly you must come to a title. They always happen last. Ah. In fact, invariably. The guy that does the graphics for the title, front titles, leaves a gap, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and it's uh, and it's always a, a real str struggle. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, with Vera Drake, for example. I mean, I we went round and round and up and down and in and out, yeah. and and I kept saying, well, you can't like, you can't just call it Vera Drake. You know, I yeah, don't yeah. I don't have names in my titles and blah, 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 all that. And then all of a sudden, it's you thought actually. You know, it's exactly right, and it's mm. uh, um, uh, similarly with secrets and lies. My prejudice was I, I hate I uh, prior to that hated having a title that somebody says in the film, and, and mm. Spall actually says secrets and lies. Why yeah, can't we all? Right. That? Yeah. You've quoted already, yeah. um, uh, and so I said, no, no, we can't call it. Maybe we should call it lies and secrets. And this went on, and yeah. finally. <laughs> Uh, Cries and whispers. <laughs> well, exactly. But somebody said, actually, you know, you're avoiding the main, the message is coming clear. You should just call it secrets. You know. So, uh, but it's, uh, you know. What about Naked? That's an off the wall title. It is an off the wall title. Um, it's obviously, um, in a sense, biblical. You're naked, you come into the world, and naked, yeah. you go out of it. And it's the, something. Here's the thing um, when it was released, in Singapore, the um, got a message saying um, the uh, authorities, the government, whoever, whoever is in charge of Singapore, um, said they could not have posters in the street saying it. They could call it naked in the cinema, mm. but it couldn't be called naked in the street. Do they, do they have an alternative title? Mm. Mm. So, overcoming the sleepless nights I had about what would be on the walls in Singapore. Um, <laughs> I suggested that, it, that the alternative title should be Raw, R-A-W. Yeah. Um, so it was advertised as Raw in the streets of Singapore, and when he went to the cinema, it was called Naked. <laughs> in the Raw, <laughs> yes. Um, Mr. Turner. Uh, for me, the great thing about Mr. Turner is that many people will have gone to it assuming it's a film about Turner's paintings that we've seen in galleries and we know this particular unique way of painting light. But in fact, it's about the man. And it's a very surprising vision of the man because until your film, most people didn't have any clue about his private life and what he really was like as an individual. How did you do your research on that? Well, I mean, it, there's not a very interesting answer. That research is research. I mean, you open the books and start to go into it and <laughs> the message is that. No, but, no but, that, but that's how... I mean, the answer to the question is how. That's how. I mean, yeah. uh, and, I mean, he was much described by all sorts of people, yeah. quoted. Um, in fact, there's, we, we, we even found one, uh, one person had actually written down verbatim how he spoke yeah. for three pages, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and so we built up a picture of the man and we tried to bring that to life. Yeah. Um, 
but it's interesting what you say about you know people not knowing. I mean, uh, a number of people at, at different times have said, "I never thought he would be. I thought he would be." And people have a sort of idea of a romantic, Byronic yeah, exactly. sort of, exactly. you know, exactly. rather gorgeous yeah. sort of person. Yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, he was smaller than Timothy Spall. He was. He was. He. That's true. Um, T Timothy Spall is far too big for the part, and I don't he know what. Over. I don't know why they cast him as that. <laughs> <laughs> But he hunched, he hunched well, in a very yes, effective I mean, way. we accepted, we knew that, but we felt that we'd, as it were, dramatised the spirit of the man mm. and uh, his style. Really. Mm. Mm. And he did, I mean, he really did. Um, uh, for example, uh, this thing where you see him uh, coming to the Royal Academy, what they call varnishing day, when all the painters were finishing off their paintings, when they could see how they were hanging and what, yeah. in relation to what other painting and in the light and so on. And he fam that event in the film, it actually happened, mm -hmm. where he went and, uh, to take the um, piss out of Constable. Constable. Yeah. He actually put this red blob on his very grey yeah. painting yeah. that had been hung next to, yeah. to Constable's very red yeah. painting and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, and he really did do this annual thing of, at this event of... of um, doing a sort of action painting mm -hmm. performance mm -hmm. of working up a painting and spitting brown powder. And nobody to this day knows what that brown powder was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing all that. Uh, 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 and so he was a showman as well as a, a great painter. And a great painter he certainly was. Yes. Uh, you're now preparing a film uh, on Peter Lou. Uh, and perhaps you could say a few words for the people who don't know about Peter Lou. Peter Lou, well, uh, um, four years after the Battle of Waterloo, um, the situation in England at that time was that only 2% of the population had the vote. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a great deal of resentment, particularly uh, in the, amongst the working classes yeah. and in the north, the factory workers. Um, there were all sorts, of, I won't go into all the details, but there was a great pro-democracy rally in which some seven, six or seven thousand people all very peacefully converged from all the outlying towns on the city of Manchester and proceeded to have a peaceful rally. The, there was still, and this is less than 20 years after the French Revolution, huge paranoia, particularly on the part of the government, mm. that there would be an English Revolution because the French Revolution had happened. And the government, very neurotically and uh, nervously, sent in the troops. People were killed uh, mm. quite substantially. And it was a, became a very famous event. It was dubbed Peter Lou because it happened in an area in the middle of Manchester called St. Peter's Fields. Mm. And a journalist s s saw a parallel between it and the Battle of Waterloo. Mm. So it became known jocularly as the Peterloo Massacre. And there are all sorts of stories attached to it, and we are going to make a feature film on this subject. How long would that take you? How long is your, do you envision 2016, 2017? We will film it in the spring and summer of 2017. 2017? Yeah, oh. and um, so this time, in two years' time, we'll be editing it, I hope. Now, how do you, how do you uh, prevail upon your your very good friends and collaborators to be available so far ahead. Yeah. They will. I mean, they want to do it. <laughs> no, they're, they're, I, mean, they're, I, I say that without arrogance. I mean, they, they, we're, they want to do it, you know, and they will, you know, uh, they will contrive to be there. Now, know? why does it, why is there that gestation? Because period? in this case, I mean, normally uh, it, we don't take that long, but, you know, there's a huge amount of research to do. Um, it's very, it's a quite a complicated thing to line up cast for it. Mm. Um, there's a huge amount of prep. I mean, for example, we've talked about all these films I've made which are in suburban houses and so mm. on, and what you do that by going to a street and filming in a house. But when we, for example, there's no way we can shoot this film where it actually happened, mm. because that was in 1819, and during the 19th century, a great Victorian city was built in Manchester all yeah, around yeah, it, you know. Yeah. So we've got to work out how uh. and where it's a very complicated operation, and so yeah. therefore um, it will be foolish to rush in and make a mess of it. So how do you divide your time? You're viewing Pirates of Pens Pens well, that's maybe. Happened. That's Yeah, but I mean, there'll presumably be some other things between now no, and... No, no, There no, won't be, so no, you'll be no, full-time No, my full-time job, even as we wow, speak, wow. apart from a weekend in Zurich, yeah. is... Um, <laughs> 
That's I'm working on it now. Yes. That's wonderful. It's wonderful, actually. Um, well, Dick Pope assured me this morning that he is on board for 2017. Yes, well, you better have been, or he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more question I'd like to ask before we throw it open to the audience, and it's going back to something I know you didn't want to go into, so we needn't go into it, which is your, your elaborate period of six, seven months preparing the script and so on. But nevertheless, I'm sure that you must have been affected by shadows when you saw it and the way that John Cassavetes w did improvise and continued to improvise. Um, and when you improv what, what have you found the advantage of improvisation is over a very fixed screenplay? Well, you see, here's the thing. The thing about shadows, and don't forget, I mean, I, that happened literally when I was just arriving in London and, you know, uh, it, what was important about that what, was simply that one realised that it had be that improvisation had taken place. Yeah. Uh, um, I have, of course, the greatest respect for much of John, what John Cassavetes did, but in the end, I think a lot of what you see in his films is actors behaving like actors. Mm. This is the actors improvising on camera. Now, given that, and we've talked about this at length in this conversation, what I'm concerned with is depicting real people in a real way. And also, as a writer, I'm concerned with very precise writing. That what you see in my films, very occasionally there are bits of improvisation, which, as there are in the films by all sorts of people. Um, but what you see is something that's very tightly written and very precise, but all of which has come out of improvisation. So improvisation is not, you see, I'm not, I'm not interested in improvisation as, a, as, a, as an affectation or as a, an end in itself. Uh, what I'm concerned with is to create something that has the feeling of spontaneity and reality, like you would expect any film mm. to, if you were a fly on the wall, as if it were yeah. real. But um, we use improvisation in a sophisticated way to arrive at something which we work out very thoroughly through rehearsal, which is very tightly scripted. So, I mean, Cassavetes and particularly Shadows was more opening up the door of possibilities yeah, yeah. than an actual influence. I wouldn't really describe, I couldn't say with any honesty that I was influenced yeah. by. But when, when, you're, when you do all this improvisation, at the end of the day, do you rush home and quickly note no. down what you've no, done? No, How do you get it down on paper? We, I don't. It doesn't go on paper. It doesn't need to. For them, for no, them. it doesn't. No, because, no. We, you, you know, by rehearsing, it, and because it's come out of something organic, okay. they simply they remember it, and it's there. And, um, uh, and also, we build this, each scene. It's only built just before the time when it's shot, mm. or, or within the period of the filming. Uh, the stuff that goes on, as you refer to, for months before that, isn't really rehearsing, and it's more about preparing and bringing into existence the premise of the film, the whole world of the film. Do you encourage people to to stay in character off screen, or do you say no? No, no. They have to. People should come out of character when they're out of character and be in character. And it's very disciplined. Yeah. Otherwise, the wires cross between the actor and the character, and it's not healthy and it's not useful. You can't. Con I mean, you know. Um, you take any number of scenes in my films, uh, uh, randomly you can pick one, and, and if you think, well, I mean, for example, somebody, uh, uh, sometime the idea got out that Brenda Blethyn had stayed in character throughout the entire time of shooting sequence. Was, well, if Brenda Blethyn had stayed in character, there wouldn't have been a film, mm. because you couldn't negotiate or rehearse or discuss <laughs> with that neurotic woman, yeah. but you could <laughs> with this very sensible person called yeah. Brenda Blethyn, who yeah. wasn't being in character, yeah. except when she was in character. Of course, you know? Well, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, we have a system, as you well know, where we have microphones. So please wait for a microphone to reach you before I have a lady back Is there. Lighting your... Is there a... I don't know. <laughs> Not really. Just Hello, Mr. Lee. Uh, I'd love to know um, uh, how did you come up uh, uh, with the Emraha uh, word for the happy-go-lucky, whether it was you or someone else, and uh, also the scene for the flamenco teacher. The it was very entertaining, the you know, in Happy Go Lucky, the flamenco teacher. Well, um, uh, at one stage, I, talking about the flamenco teacher, one stage we were developing the thing, and I, I was working with Sally Hawkins, who plays Poppy. And um, I, sh I said, well, 
she said, well, she'd do other things. She'd have other interests. You know. um, I said, well, like what? She said, well, um, she, maybe she'd go to tango. Tango last tango classes. And I was also starting to work, and I wasn't quite sure what we were going to do with this actress, Corina Fernandez, who I knew uh, was a good mover and knows about things Spanish. I love flamenco. I mean, I think it's great. Anyway, so I've got a bit of a passion for flamenco. So I said, well, how about flamenco? And we, out of all this came this. And uh, uh, Corina went... She researched it. We even sent her down to Seville for a weekend. It was very nice. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she, uh, 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 and um, uh, she went to watch Flamenco. But then, of course, we put it together with this character. And um, suddenly we had this scene, you know. And, and the, the, the Enra Ha, that's just, you know, um, <laughs> this guy, this mad <laughs> obsessive. You know, he's got all these conspiracies. And one of the things that he was, so there's, you know, the evil eye, you know, and the, you know, and Enraha is part of all that subculture, you know, and it's, um, it's mirror signal maneuver, you know, and it's the eye, on the eye at the top of the triangle, you know, and all that. It's bullshit, really. <laughs> Can I tell a funny story? Um, Eddie Marsan, who plays that character, was filming, making a film. Uh, in Canada. I'm going to forget something in a minute. What are they called? The Cohen's. Um, and he got a call from his agent saying, uh, the, the Cohen brothers would like to see you in LA if you can manage to get down there. So he said, oh yes, that would be great. I'm not sure what film it was for. Um, so he got permission to take a day off or something. And his agent warned him, and then somebody else said to him, you have to go into the interview in character. You have to read the script, you have to go in character, and uh, you have to stay in character, and that's what you have to do. They're only interested in that, the Cohen brothers. So he thought, right, and he's a very good character actor, obviously, and he worked out how the character would be, and he got into this American character, and he went down there, and he, you know, he walked up and down in the room outside, making sure he was in character, and he went in, and he said, hi. And uh, they sat down, and they said, first question, what, what does Enraha mean? <laughs> <laughs> Another question, there was somebody over here, yes. Um, okay, does this work? Yes. Um, you said that you're doing, uh, you're shooting the film with the, um, um, with the, the Schauspieler? Actors. With the actors. So you're developing the movie with the actors. Do you also do the research with the actors, or is the research something that you do before you start working with the actors? Uh, both. Um, it depends on the film. Um, but it, it, with, on all of my films, all actors research something. Even if it's, if somebody's playing, uh, has got a job of some sort, they go off and research that job. People work out, you know, where they grew up, where they went to school, they go and visit the school, all sorts of things, you know. Um, you, you know, read the books the character would have read, watch the movies the characters would have watched, listen to the music the character would listen to, it, go to places they would have gone on holiday, whatever. Um, it's research, and sometimes the research, you know, is quite sophisticated. Um, Jim Broadbent for another year, researched being a geologist, for example. So actors, you know, I mean, one of the things which we didn't say, which is important, is that this kind of stuff only works for intelligent actors. <laughs> and there are plenty of actors in the world who are not intelligent. <laughs> but none of them are in my films. <laughs> <laughs> or at least not many of them. I'm from Manchester. Oh, yeah. And I Where? want Which to ask part? you. Sorry? Where? Um, Burnley, <laughs> South Manchester. Oh. What I want to ask you, though, it resonated before when you mentioned the film Room at the Top and If and uh, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning. Mine's um, 
Mine digresses a bit from some of your films, but what I'd like to ask you, have you any thoughts on um, Basil Dearden's film, Victim, with Dirk Bogard Dirk and um, Sylvia Sims? Yes. Well, uh, Tell uh, us about that, then, what you think. Well, I only, you. Uh, only that, um, that at that time that would be a bold film to make. Yeah, if I could step in, I would just say, I was thought of it, I thought of that film 20 minutes ago when we were talking about Vera Drake and you said, you know, abortion at that time. And I was thinking, well, Victim, I remember seeing that. And it was the first film uh, uh, about a, a gay man that was front and centre. Yes. And, and so it was courageous. It was time. courageous. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it was. I mean, I suppose I would have to say that, and it's probably a, 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 an unnecessary and wrong thing to say, but that I would separate the, in the intention and the commitment and the integrity of that film from its style, yeah. because it's still an old-fashioned British yeah. movie in its style and rendering yeah. and its way of, of characterising and looking at people and the world. But in terms of its politics and its commitment, I, it's a very impressive and important film. Yeah. Thank you for your question. It's an honor to talk to you, Mr. Lee. Uh, I have a, a Polynesian daughter, and Secret and Lies really spoke tremendously to us. And um, in, in many of your films, your characters are ordinary people. They're working class people, whereas in Hollywood, we often have the, the superheroes and, and, and so on. And uh, so I have a two-part question. Why do you focus on working class people, ordinary people, and how do you keep a film interesting for the audience if the characters are not on the surface, quote unquote, extraordinary people? Well, the short answer to that is that, as far as I'm concerned, everybody is interesting. But I, I wouldn't know what else to say by way of answering your question. I, um, I, I suppose the only thing I, I, I would want to say about what you said in your question is that, so far as I'm concerned, Hollywood has got absolutely nothing to do with the kind of serious filmmaking that we who make world cinema far away from Hollywood, are concerned with. And I say we who make world cinema, I'm talking about people all around the world, everywhere, except in Hollywood, because Hollywood is a different culture and a different language, and it has nothing to do with anything we're talking about here, really. And, of course, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan weren't exactly working class. No, and, and I, no, but I wasn't going to say that, because I don't think it's... I mean, since you mention it, uh, there are loads of characters in my films who are not from a working class background, but they are, we're looking at everybody... Um, across the board, because everybody's interesting, really. Incl and, but you're right to say, you know, of course, uh, 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 the, the, the conceit of saying, well, let's look at people who are apparently uninteresting, who are apparently ordinary, in s just by, by looking at them and by sh taking time to be with them, you start to find that they are interesting, because, uh, as I say, everybody is. Another question. Uh, can I just go to the back for once? I've neglected the people. It's right at the back in the last row. The lady's standing up. Sorry, can you wait for the, can you wait for the mic, please? Thanks, Craig. Speaking of extraordinary, I thought Poppy was extraordinary. I thought she stood out. My question would be, did you or have you ever created characters around the, the actors before you wrote them in? Because she sort of stood out like the character actress in Juno did where she really was exceptional. Okay. Yes, I, I, yes I do. In fact, I do that a lot. Uh, and I certainly did it in that particular case, in the sense that I thought, I mean, I'd worked with Sally Hawkins a few times before that, and I knew her very well. And I thought, OK, let's make a film where we put Sally at the middle of the center of the thing, and we tap into that energy she has. But that isn't, I mean, that's, that's as far as it goes. That's the starting point. Then the job was to sit down with her and to think carefully and to, to construct a character which 
did that, which utilized or capitalized on that quality, but that became a character who in no way is Sally Hawkins, is a whole different sort of person. But, you know, that energy is there. So um, it isn't so much, in practical terms, um, doing it before... We, I mean, in all the things I do, I collaborate with the actor. I very often sit down at the beginning of the process with an actor, and I, don't, I do not know where we're going to go. And I gradually, it becomes clear to me where to go, and my creative thing starts happening. Um, but the job is to collaborate with the actor, and although one is not dramatizing the personality of the actor, at the same time, it, it's implicitly obvious that you take on, you know, part of the decision that you make is that it, it's, it's a good part for that actor to play. We have time for one more question. What about the middle of the room? There's been anybody? No? anybody? Someone over there. I just in a white shirt. Thank you. I'm living in Helvetia, and because all of us one day will live this life, and now I have the possibility to make you a question which I haven't done yesterday to Mr. Jean Jacques Anot. If you could uh, make a film with another filmmaker, for example, like uh, Costas Gavras, uh, is it possible to make the question to you? You are a great filmmaker. Uh, to make a film maybe with another other filmmaker, it was one uh, thought in your life? To mean to collaborate, yes. to share it with another yes. filmmaker. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm more important, why would he or she want to do that? Yes. I think what it may mean is that sometimes there are these portmanteau films where for charity someone says, you know, would you make a five-minute segment and he's going to make a five-minute segment. Oh, well, if that's, that's a possibility. There's no, no, reason, to that extent you there's no reason why not, but I don't think you meant that, no, did you? How do you imagine what you're talking about? Yes. Seriously? Yes. Yes, because for a, a film actor, uh, when he has a role, he, he is just one role. And uh, with uh, somebody to discuss uh, uh, with your co-filmmaker uh, how you uh, want that uh, the actors will do the things uh, they do in the film. So to, to ask the opinion of uh, also the other one. Uh, because it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's a very uh, personal question, but... Uh, it's a very eccentric question, certainly. <laughs> um, the Cohen brothers do it because they talk to each other. Yeah, but they're brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, no disrespect. It's not. I've never thought of it before, and I think I could safely say I'm never going to think of it again. Well, Mike, you've made us cry in many films, but today you've made us laugh a lot. Thank you so much for coming here well, and spending you know, the time. Zurich has that effect on me, really. <laughs> Thank you.